Thank you all so much for being here. Malisha, I will hand it over to you and we'll get some audience questions after um, a little bit of conversation. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Um, Mark, you probably have been producing longer than most of us on here. <laughs> I think you said 25 years. Uh, it's been a little bit longer than that, but uh, oh, I'll make 25. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, how did you get your start? And okay. why is this diversifying film crews, why is it important? Sure, sure. Uh, I got my start when I was at Tennessee State University. I started uh, interning uh, my junior year. And uh, during my junior and senior year, what I did was I tried to make one opportunity and turn it into another. I uh, interned with a lot of different companies, uh, Deaton Flanagan Productions, uh, Jim Owens Productions. At one point, Comcast had a community affairs station, so I interned with them. And uh, a lot of those opportunities actually turned into uh, jobs as PAs. Uh, diversity is very important because there's a lot of talent out there that just doesn't have access. And I think that a community is made up of everyone that's a part of a particular city. And I think that everyone should have an opportunity to work and learn and most important, network. Awesome, awesome. Um, Gabby, I'm going to ask you the same question. How did you get your start and why is this topic important? Yeah, um, so I got my start in, um, I went to MTSU and studied journalism there. Um, and while I was in college, I started, I interned my senior year at Part Two Pictures. They're a documentary production company uh, based out of New York. So I interned there for the summer, and when I got back, I got hired at Channel 4 my senior year. Um, so I started working there as an associate producer, worked my way up to a multimedia producer uh, during the day. And I kind of always knew I wanted to do more documentaries um, and not news. So me and some friends started doing a documentary on our own, and we got a lot of traction on it. So I ended up leaving Channel 4. Um, in that year that I left, I met Nathan Thompson and we kind of talked about getting me started working at Contrast Visuals. Um, so then I got started there and it started producing and project managing. Um, but the goal has always been to write and direct. So even while I was working there and producing and project managing, I was always writing, always uh, developing different content. And uh, five years later, that kind of started paying off this year to where I've started getting directing jobs, um, been developing some documentary content as well. So that's kind of where I got my start. Um, and just, I feel like diversity, the biggest reason it's important is just, you're hearing different stories, you're getting a different look. Um, if you're always going to the same types of people, you're always going to get the same types of content. Uh, and so you're always going to miss even j just the way things are shot, uh, the different stories that black people, Asians, women, uh, I feel like you're just missing a lot of things in the world and other perspectives if you don't have diversity. Thank you, great. And I think I saw Kristen join in. Did I see her? Yes, hi, Malisha. Hey, so the question I ask is, um, how did you get your start and why is this topic important? Uh, so I got my start, um, I kind of have two starts to my current career. So I, at the early young plucky age of you know, 22 after college, I immediately moved out to Los Angeles to pursue my, my dream of being in the film and television industry. And I got some amazing experience working um, at a small studio called Regency Productions. I was in the story department, which was really cool because I um, was able to, we got all the scripts coming into the small studio and then we went out and got coverage for them. And then they, it came back to the creative executives. So I was able to experience kind of the heartbeat of a small studio. And I got to know what 
um, you know, what readers were looking at, what would make a script suddenly pop, and then actually did coverage myself for um, about a year. So it really gets you to read scripts quickly and understand it. Um, and then I went to work for the Writers Guild of America and was in the TV credits department and in the membership department. So um, I actually helped with credits arbitration. So I understood some of the ins and outs of why TV credits were so important, what are the different nuances around it and why um, um, you know, different credits mean different things for different people. So that was a huge education for me early in my early 20s. And then um, sort of life happened and I was a very um, insecure and experienced, you know, 20 something year old woman and I just left the business and thought, well, I'm supposed to now go into um, work for, you know, I went into uh, working in the um, nonprofit sector. So I started working for the YMCA um, and thought that was my career trajectory. And I just kept getting tapped on the shoulder to tell stories. And so even in my career um, with the Y, I would do different videos, different fundraising videos, different thank you videos. And then um, uh, ended up, I was the um, arts and humanities specialist for YMCA the USA. And then in doing that, I started working doing video on the side part-time. So while I had a full-time job, I started a small SVOD company. So a small company, very similar to Netflix. But because, um, and I actually started it when Netflix and Hulu very first started. So when Netflix was moving to their subscription on demand and when Hulu uh, launched and at first, Hulu was free. I don't know if a lot of people remember that. They were a free service that was ad supported and then they couldn't make enough money. So they um, started charging. So I started telofilms.com and we really focused on stories about the lesbian queer community because um, I wasn't seeing that represented on television or anywhere else. So I thought, why not start you know, my own company that um, allows my community to see themselves represented on television. And so kind of in my early 30s, I kind of came back into uh, the industry making short form content. And um, in that process, we've gotten three Emmy nominations. And um, now our, uh, we are about to release our second feature film, um, a holiday rom-com called I Hate New Year's. So I've been able to kind of almost come full circle and be um, making, instead of it being my side gig, it's now my main gig. Um, and I think, you know, obviously I started my company because I wasn't seeing myself represented. And I think one of the most important things that we can do is to diversify the voices because we've just had straight white guys um, controlling our content since almost the beginning. And women's voices haven't been there, um, queer voices haven't been there, black voices haven't been there. And so I think that when you um, have diversity of thought, diversity of story, it helps with empathy, it helps with understanding. Um, and, it, and for our community, I, I, or for any community, I actually think it saves lives. Um, I truly believe that if someone doesn't see their story represented, then they feel like they aren't worthy of their story being told. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, if my story is not being told, am I of value? So I think the more we can get diverse voices out there, the more we can magnify that, the more we can show different stories, people, recognize that their lives are worthy of stories being told about them. Awesome, awesome, thank you for that. So I'm just gonna open up a question and any of our panelists can ask this. Um, all of us are based in Nashville and I'm probably assuming a lot of our audience are here in Nashville. So what are the primary challenges you see for artists from diverse backgrounds, whether it be people of color, LGBTQ, 
women. What are the pri primary challenges you see for those populations in Nashville? Gabby? Uh, <laughs> Let's start calling people. <laughs> um, even just from a female perspective, I feel like a lot of times uh, a lot of the guys will just hire each other and it's nothing against anyone. Personally, usually it's just everybody's, a, I mean, I feel like we're on set for 12 hours a day, so we just hire all our friends. Uh, but sometimes that can be a hindrance because you're not hiring outside of your friend group, obviously. And so if all my friends, uh, and I know we kind of talked about this the other day, but with Kristen, but if all my friends are female and so I just hire all my female friends, we could make a dope film, but like at the end of the day, I'm leaving out a lot of amazing people as well. Um, so I feel like that sometimes can happen, especially in Nashville. Um, it's just easy to hire your friends in, uh, Nashville isn't even the most, <laughs> yeah, my dog's <laughs> popping in, but Nashville just in general isn't super diverse. So I feel like you do have to kind of go out of your circle, um, which I've seen a lot of people doing and reaching out and seeing who knows who. Um, and I feel like that's just like the biggest thing is uh, you have to go out of your circle a little bit. So um, I, I can say that also, um, we kind of talked about this the other day, but our crew, um, I consider it as a diverse crew, but of course, we're the crew we work with is mostly black, and mostly, and it's not because we're, you know, ex excluding people. It's more because a lot of the crew that we work with, a lot of times, they don't have other opportunities, so we try to create opportunities for them to work on certain things or to learn or to men, you know, kind of mentor them because there is no other opportunities so then i think people kind of look at us like you're not that diverse so how are you talking about being diverse but it's um i see it more because it's a lack of opportunity does other people see that sometimes it, it can be that way i know uh one challenge i've had from time to time is i started out as an editor and so whenever i would work with uh clients that didn't look like me, I kind of felt as though they were questioning my skill level. I remember one instance, um, I was working with a client, they came into town and uh, me and my assistant, which was white, we were sitting in the control room in the edit bay and they started talking to him right away. And he points to me, he's like, no, you want to talk to him because he's the editor, I'm the assistant. So uh, it hasn't happened a lot, but from time to time, yeah, you'll, you'll find some people that really kind of undervalue or underestimate your skills. Okay, thank you. I want to ask someone who wanted to be on the panel, and he's on, um, but he kind of didn't know his schedule until yesterday. But Dwayne, do you have anything to add? It, hey, hey, everybody. Um, I just I think it, it's such a wonderful topic that, that you guys have, have brought up, and I'm so happy I was able to, to at least just listen in. Um, the, I think the, the topic in and of itself really like reminds me of, um, I used to coach gymnastics, and I think there is, there's so, certainly a science to um, the whole seeing and believing aspect um, of things where sometimes we would have kids working really, really hard on a skill that they just couldn't seem to get. And in the whole gymnastics world, there's a lot of migration from gym to gym. And so you'd see some kids come over to our club that were in a different club. And if that kid was able to throw that skill, all of a sudden, immediately, you see this trickle down effect of all of the other kids in that program, all of a sudden, because they could see it, they start to believe it. And once that, that chain breaks in the mind, the floodgates are open. Uh, and this kid's throwing the skill, and then this one's throwing the skill, and another, and another, and another. And I think there's, there's something very true about that to, to life in general, where if we can just see it, 
um, then all of a sudden it's, it's very achievable. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of opportunity to see for people to see themselves in positions of, of success and of greatness in underrepresented uh, communities. Um, and I know just the, I've got a, an uncle in Chicago that's working very, very tirelessly to, to build some programs where um, he can show, hey, if you, you're so interested in music, there's another side to music. They're the people, um, they're the engineers and they're, there's uh, film scores and there's this film business where you don't have to be on the screen, where there's such a thing as a, as a grip or a gaffer. Um, and it's just another one of those things where it's the second that they can see it, the second that, that it becomes a reality, all of a sudden it, it, it's, it's achievable. Um, and so I think there's something really important about us having this conversation and making it a very intentional thing in our, in our minds and in our community to, to make it um, a goal to allow people that potentially never even thought that they could uh, to be able to see themselves, for them to be able to, to, to look and say, hey, that looks just like me and that the person walks like me and talks like me and potentially represents my, my neighborhood and the place that I came from and they're doing it. So maybe I can as well. Thank you for that. And thank you for that. Um, so the next question I want to ask is um, the argument I think I hear the most is um, I just want to hire the best. So and it's not necessarily they say, well, the best is not necessarily a minority, but they're, they're higher um, the best and not necessarily I look at race or color or gender or, you know, whatever. Um, so what are you, you all's thoughts about that? I think about that's people easy. who make that argument. That's such an easy throwaway excuse. You know what I mean? I think that's like, that's like someone going, oh, you know, I, I'm like, this isn't the, I, sometimes you have these, when you want to dig into a conversation and you want to get into like why something is the way it is, I have found, especially being in, a non, in the nonprofit um, sector for the years that I was, you know, suddenly like you're really looking at maybe something like education reform. I promise this will get back to your question, Malisha. And then you you look at that and like suddenly you're really trying to figure out education reform and then someone goes well you know it's just cuz like you got to solve poverty first and you're like what do you what do you, what do you mean you have to solve they and that's a way of going ugh this is just like if we don't solve poverty we're never going to solve this so let's just start thinking about something else so this whole thing like i just want to hire the best is just the lazy person's excuse for not like truly digging in and like trying to look at what is outside of the scope of of what they want to see on their set so it's just easy to just kind of put those blinders on and go well look all i see is the best and that's just who i'm going to hire and you're not even taking them off and even considering it so i just think like if someone gives me that answer i'm like you're what's the point of having this conversation with you because you're you're not going to change you're not going to understand why having diverse people around helps broaden the experience um, and helps broaden your storytelling and helps broaden your problem solving skills. So I, I just think that's a BS excuse. Awesome. Anyone, any other thoughts on that? When people argue, I'm just hiring the best. I, I've got a, a couple of thoughts on that as well. The, I, I work as an AD. Um, as well as a director. And so in some ways, I can see why any producer um, will say to themselves, you know, I just, I know this guy's good. So that's who we're calling. Because I think every producer's livelihood is on the line if the job goes bad. And so is there some level of truth to, I've just got to hire the people that I know can do the jobs? Sure. And I think the the thing that has to to be talked about is that the fact that there's some people that are just as good that are being overlooked 
And there are some people that are going to be just as good that have just never gotten the chance to, to prove it. Um, and so then it becomes this, this thing where you have to be very intentional about um, going and seeking out a diverse crew because the, it's just the, the reality at the end of the day is that by the time the client and the agency and all of the money gets rolled in and all of the weight is on making sure that that shoot goes very smoothly. Um, it's just going to be a default thing to go to, um, like what Gabby was saying, just the, the people that I know, or, or like, the, it, this is my crew, this is my circle, this is like, these are my girls, we know we're going to kill this. Or what Mark was saying as well, where he's just like, you know, it's just, you've got to actually look for it. Um, and so the, I don't think it's going to happen by accident because there is so much pressure at the end of the day with the tens of thousands of dollars that are on the line there's pressure, real pressure there to get the job done and to get it done well, or else none of us work. Um, but the, there are the PAs that we can give opportunities to. Someone gave me a shot um, and I, I grabbed it and just took off with it. And there, there's a list of, of people waiting to do that. And then there are people that are already experienced that have maybe um, gone away from the business, like Kristen was saying, and, and have just been on hiatus because they didn't get the shot. They didn't get the look. They didn't get the opportunity. They didn't get the text message or the phone call. And so I think the key word there is like intention. Yes, it's a real thing that we've just got to hire the best and we should hire the best. Um, but there should also be intention of creating the best and passing on information and passing on skill sets and passing on the, the whole idea of each one teach one, um, becoming something greater than just a, a mantra within African-American communities, but also within the film community, because that's just, I think we all realize that even coming out of film school, you still need someone to, to kind of take you by the arm and say, I believe in you. Um, and so that's, that's on all of us to, to make sure that there's someone around us that we're doing that with, that we're training up, that we're teaching all the tricks of the trade to, that we're imparting information into. Um, because without doing that, that person never gets the opportunity for the text message that says, hey, are you available? And so there's, there's certainly some, some truth to, to what you're saying, but there's some intention that's missing and that has not been there that, that helps that cause. And, and I think it's very important that people know who the other talent is because when Nashville is busy, I mean, it's busy and all your favorite people are booked for weeks at a time. So who's going to fill those positions? If you take the leap to get to know other people, you're never run into a situation where you're having to call all over town. You have a list of people that you can call to fill those positions. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer to that? Okay. My next question, what have you noticed over the years in regards to hiring practices, the production hiring practices here in Nashville? Has it changed? Has it been more intentional? Is it the same? Do you feel like we're progressing? I know this year, you know, especially with all the unrest, you know, there has been a lot of companies that kind of stepped up and said, you know, we're, we're being intentional about diversity and inclusion. Do you feel like that is happening here in Nashville? Anyone could take that. I think it's changed a lot. When I started, let's see, I started in production maybe like in 91 and I would say 99.8 of the uh, sets I was on, I was the only black person. Later, you know, there were other people that came into town that were on shows, on shoots. But for the most part, I think it's more people in the industry. Now, I don't know if they're having a hard time, you know, finding work and staying employed, but there are more people uh, working in the various departments. You're on mute. Yeah, 
Sorry. I try to mute just to make sure there's no background noise. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I haven't been in the industry as long, so I'm trying to think. Um, I can't say that I've noticed a more diverse film sets recently, but I definitely have noticed, especially after this year, a lot more people reaching out, hitting me up if I know any uh, people of color that could be on set um, in different various positions and things like that. So I definitely see a lot of people posting about it, wanting, um, for instance, Nick Allen, he's a DP in town. He's been really adamant about, um, and I kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, but even just mentorship and mentoring um, the younger generation coming up um and i would say that's really close to my heart because i feel like a lot of people have mentored me um and helped me come up in the industry as well and get to the point that i'm at now um and so i feel like i've seen a lot of people recently make a lot more strides to help and bring people in when they can and um so yeah i definitely feel like i've seen a lot more people putting an effort to make crews more diverse I think the same thing um, for me. I think um, this year, especially, I've been reached out to more, and people are, I've seen more intention definitely um, happening um, here around Nashville, especially. Um, okay, Kristen, I want to ask you about you talked about um, the importance of having diverse voices on set. Can you tell me your experience in regards to that and why it was important for you to have diverse voices? Um, yeah, I think I, so I tend to be like just super collaborative on set and in my work. And I think when, and I make um, indie films. So, you know, I don't have, huge budgets. So I'm trying to get eight or nine pages a day, um, you know, and keep my production 14, 14 days, which, you know, it's not a music video, which is like, you know, sometimes single digit days and it's not a pilot. So I need a group that's going to be working together. Um, that's going to be able to problem solve. That's going to be able to make adjustments. And I, what I have found is um, as soon as you get uh, on some of the film sets I've had, as soon as I've had, this has happened, you know, or, or a lot earlier in my career, but when you have like almost like homogenized thinking, you're problem solving things in the same way and you can't problem solve things in the same way and, and hope that it's going to result in something that's, you know, or, or if you have people who argue for way too long over something that is stupid in the script that doesn't really matter. It, it'll make your day go longer. So I think for me, having people with diverse thought process, processes and diverse backgrounds actually helps problem solve things so much quicker and in ways that I would have never thought of. But all of a sudden, you know, you're in someone's garage and you have three different people from three completely different backgrounds looking at how you can make that into you know a drivable scene using a screen and lights and a projector and if you you know if i didn't have you know sa micah and you out in that garage we would have been driving around nashville burning all kinds of like craziness trying to do 18 pages of conversation in a car so you know when you when you can have that thought process and people that just come in with like all these different pieces, you just problem solve more efficiently, which is exactly what you have to do in this business. If you want to stay on budget, come in early, come in under. Um, so that, that's why I just hi highly, highly value that diversity of thinking. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to answer that? Remind me of the question one more time. It's the importance of having diversity and diversity voices on set. Yeah, I was kind of thinking too, I feel like even just um, in storytelling and writing, it's very important um, just because I know 
I work more in documentaries and things like that. And sometimes there's questions I ask or even writing in scripts, things where I've sent scripts to people. And just for an instance, I, in one of my scripts I wrote, there was like a kid sitting in a hoodie with a bag of Skittles and an, uh, again, Arizona iced tea. And immediately I feel like every black person knows I'm referencing Trayvon Martin, but every, every, uh, person that wasn't black that I sent the script had no clue what I was talking about. Um, but, and they were like, you should take that out or whatever. And I was like, no, like, this is going to make sense to the people I'm speaking to. Um, and so I feel like when you have diversity on set and even in script writing, um, it just makes all the difference. And I feel like too, we've seen so many times as well, like the Pepsi commercial will Kendall, Gen Kendall Jenner hands a Pepsi to an ends of protest. It's like, were there any, <laughs> was anybody in the room that said this probably isn't a good idea? <laughs> so I feel like uh, if you don't have diverse people on set or uh, in the room at all, there's even potential for brands to just make huge mistakes that loses them money. Um, so obviously it's important in storytelling, but at the end of the day, it could be life-changing for whoever is in charge of putting out the money. Yeah, I've even heard uh, stories from actresses that said that they had to come to set camera ready, that the hair and makeup uh, team didn't know how to do their hair or do their makeup. So I think it's also very important that, you know, people that know how to do, you know, African-American hair is a part of that glam squad. So people won't have to do that. That is so true. And I've done a, a few things in front of the camera. And I had that difficulty a couple times with hair and makeup where you get to set and they don't, they look at you like a deer in headlights, like, what do I do? Um, I'm more darker toned. So a lot of times they don't have my color. So it ends up being, you know, you need to bring your own stuff. You need to bring this. And um, um, it's, it's okay if that was expected, but you know, it, it's kind of unfair, you know? And you've heard celebrities talk about that. Like they've had to bring their own stuff. <laughs> you know, other actresses, um, they have the hair, you know, the hair and makeup team that can do them, but um, a lot of African-Americans or other people of color, they just don't have the um, skill to do that hair. So I think it, I do agree that it is very, very important to diversify down to, you know, hair and makeup. And I agree with you, Gabby, when you were talking about, you know, even having um, diverse people on your team. We've heard a lot, especially this year and the last couple of years of brands getting in trouble because you <laughs> used the Kylie Jenner example, but there's been plenty of other brands that got in trouble because there wasn't anyone on their team to tell them, oh, that's probably not a good idea. This is not a good look because this group of people could be offended by, you know, this or that. So it is definitely important um, to have diversity. So how can, how can we change here in Nashville? How can we, how can we change? How can we be more progressive here in Nashville with our, um, how, what, okay. How can we change and what advice can we tell producers or the other people hiring crews to help get to a diverse set? Anybody? I think I think producers, uh, production managers, they just need to get out of their comfort zone and uh, find out, you know, who's available out here. I mean, there are a lot of people that are very talented, that have a lot of experience, that may even come from uh, film hubs that are living here in Nashville. Uh, another thing is uh, people need to get involved. I'm a member of the Nashville Filmmakers Guild. I'm a part of uh, the workshop and uh, events committee with Amanda. And so we had, before COVID, we had like a lot of mixers that people could attend and just meet people. 
uh, another uh, event that I attend monthly. There's not a whole lot of film people there, but there are a few film people there, and that's Creative Mornings. For people that are into faith-based uh, filmmaking, there's uh, the Faith and Film Breakfast Club. You know, there's Women in Film. Uh, there's the International Black Film Festival, Nashville. It's the Nashville Film Festival. So you just have to get out of your comfort zone and just go and meet people. And, and I even uh, would like to uh, make that suggestion to people that are interested in getting into the industry. You know, go where these people are, you know, reach out to production companies, get to know who the line producers are, the production managers are. I would even, I even reached out to directors and producers and production company owners when I was young and starting out. So it, it's just all about meeting the right people. It's like, almost like a matchmaking type of deal. That's good. Um, Kristen, what could producers do to diversify? Well, I mean, I think first coming in with the intention to do so. Um, Cause I think that again, there's amazing filmmakers in this town, amazing crew people. And I think if you have the intention of coming in and saying like, I want to have a set that's 50% women, that's 50% people of color, you know, like you might not, you might not hit that the first time out, but at least you're looking at having an intention of doing that and just starting to also build, you know, I, I just think, you know, we all have our go-to crew list. You know, it's like, all right, who's the first person I'm going to call if I need a first AD? All right, if they are not available, who's the second person? So building that in a way that helps diversity so that you can, I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, if, if you have, you know, one white guy, then the second position you hire can't be another white guy or something like that. I'm just saying like, or like all of a sudden that person's off the list because, you know, but I, I'm just saying like, if you don't start off with a Rolodex or a, or a, um, a crew list that even hints at any kind of diversity, then you, you, know, you, you need to work hard to try and hire for that. So, I mean, when you and I met, Malisha, like, I mean, how long did we meet before we worked on a project together? Was it like a year and a half or two years? Yes, yes, about two years. Finally, like when I came to Nashville and I wanted to make this movie, Malisha was the first person I called and I knew because like we had hung out together, we had had parties together, we met like filmmakers together. So it was absolutely my intention for that year and a half to kind of cultivate and figure out how could I crew up for, for my indie project. And I couldn't have done that without you and Asher and meeting, you know, Patrick and, you know, all the, all the folks who, you know, I can now call, I mean, I can call up and we'll hire those, we'll hire the same people again. And I know I will have, you know, a, a wonderfully diverse, the best <laughs> crew in, in Nashville. And, and so I think it's coming in with that intention and actually taking some time to go, how can I network with more people of color or more women filmmakers, like whatever the diversity is that you, that you're looking at doing. So I just, I don't know, like I was super intentional about it. And now I'm starting to build my own, you know, I always call you anyway for whatever I need. But so, I mean, I would just say, if you want to diversify your crew, call Malisha. <laughs> <laughs> Best people in town. Um, <laughs> but, you know, until you can do that, like, I mean, gee, like find a female filmmaker somewhere, find a black person and like, see who their crew, you know what I mean? I just, it's not that hard. It might take a few extra phone calls or a coffee or a lunch here and there, but I, I don't know. I just, yeah. I, I also do, I, I have, I don't know where we are time, but I do think something that I have found in, in coming to Nashville that's different. So I used, I did productions in LA for like 10 years before this and, and they were teeny tiny budgets as well. And one of the things that I was really hesitant, again, until I met Malisha about crewing up in Nashville, was in Nashville, I have found, again, this is just my experience, um, that it's really hard to get, like, there's not a, all different levels of kind of films that are being made here. Um, and so 
again, like credits are everything in LA. Like if you want to up level, if you want to get into a union, it's hours that you've worked doing the thing that you want to do. So you can usually find someone who's like a first AC, who's an amazing DP, but they won't let them be a DP on a bigger budget movie until they have the credits. So you can get that indie person who's amazing, who they won't give a shot to on a bigger budget, who you can get for your small budget because they're looking to up level with credits. And so I think I haven't found that to be the case as much in Nashville because you don't have this like as much of a robust um, film production group. You either have like stuff that's coming in that's bigger budget or a big budget music video, which again is very different than a film. Or you have like the tiny, like I have absolutely no money, but let's go make a movie. And I just haven't found that ultra low budget, something shooting for 300,000, something shooting for a half a million, something shooting, you know, so I think the more Nashville can build different um, tiers almost of filmmaking, instead of having this like huge chasm of like almost no indie, it's gonna, it, it's gonna be, um, I think it's just going to be interesting to kind of build that in. And I'm, again, I'm speaking from the film perspective because I just, I make, you know, narrative movies. Um, and so I have found that to be an interesting nuance about the, this town that, um, again, I don't mean to keep singing malicious praises, but that's the only way I was able to crew up. So I wouldn't have been able to find it if you hadn't have already kind of done those also in Nashville. Thank you. So great. I thank you for the opportunities also. So it was definitely a great opportunity. Um, so I think we have a few questions from. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, I can help okay. with those, Malisha. Thank you. Um, yeah, Hunter asks about um, if, if any of you filmmakers have been um, helping find next generation of filmmakers by going into schools, um, sort of touching on the mentoring piece that y'all were talking about earlier and specifically to Dwayne I'm glad you said that Dwayne made an, a fantastic short film I just made the connection who you were Dwayne um called Black Thoughts and anyway it would be so great in in the Bell Courts after school program so I would love to have you as our guest sometime showing the film to students but are any of you working with young filmmakers no I do I uh I've hired a lot of students from the National Film Institute and um, I work for Mount Zion Media, which is the marketing department for Mount Zion Baptist Church, as well as owning my own company. And so I just recently hired uh, a female that's in their cinema program. So I hire college students all the time. That's great. Thank you guys so much for that. I'd, I'd be thrilled and honored to, to do any and everything that that's, that's possible with the film to, to kind of help put a dent in some of the things that we're facing. And um, I have not personally had the chance to uh, reach out to any school students in the, in the area. Um, but it's, it, it is crazy that the piece itself is doing that. Um, so in New York, there's a, there are a couple of art schools that have reached out and they're now using the, the piece as diversity training in Chicago. There's the uh, um, Art Institute of Chicago that's interested in using it as, as a piece for diversity training. Um, and that kind of circles us back to one of the things that we talked about earlier, the question of how can we actually do this? What's the practical how? Like how do we diversify these sets? And I think there is a part of it that really uh, has to do with what's happening offset when we're not on the film crew to change the mentality and change the, uh, to break the stereotypes, to, to shatter some of the, um, the, the walls that are there that a lot of us don't know are there. Because I think at the end of the day, even if we were to hand a producer a list of, of names, there's still the stereotypes that go down and, and you see Marquis at a shit and it's like, no, pass. And you see um, a name that maybe looks like it's uh, Arabic and, and you pass. And so there's, there's the offset work of, of trying to, to snap the, the very, very difficult um, uh, bar that that's that exists that keeps a lot of those people from getting opportunities before they even get to show up and prove themselves 
Um, and man, that's, it, it really is a massive, massive task, but I think things like this certainly help that. Um, and then it turns into, um, entertaining the conversation with the, the guy in the coffee shop the next time that, that maybe wants to talk that, that doesn't look like you and doesn't sound like you or walk like you or talk like you. And then all of a sudden, when you see someone that maybe fits that same description, there's more of that willingness to give them a shot or give them a chance. Because I think the sad reality that we can all admit as well is that even if a person that is underrepresented makes their way onto set, there's still the stereotypes in the back of the mind where that PA makes a mistake. And because of those stereotypes, they're just scrutinized that much more heavily as opposed to uh, someone else that's more familiar on a set. And so it's such a tall task and all of these things become a part of the, the ingredient to, to solving the problem. Uh, a of being more intentional of saying, Hey, like, there are some people that really hate the idea of equal opportunity employment. They think that it's just giving a leg up to people that don't deserve it. And going into intentionality and hiring, knowing that that's potentially going to be an issue with some people, but, but seeing, Hey, I mean, it is on us to open a door that has been closed for some. Um, there's the other side of needing to make sure that um, we get out and network uh, the way that Mark was talking about. There's the, the side of, of making sure that we reach out to uh, people in the community, the way that Kristen was talking about being able to, hey, just find a Malisha, find a Gabby, start asking questions. Who do you love? Who, who are you just crazy about? Who would you love to, to see have an opportunity? And then there's the stuff at home where um, we don't get to live in our bubbles as much where maybe you turn on some content that you wouldn't have turned on before. Maybe you start watching a documentary that you wouldn't have watched before. Well, we start changing the culture, um, at home as well. And I think if we put all of that together, maybe just maybe we'll, we'll start to see some change. Thank you. And we're, we've got just a few more minutes. Um, a question from John um, says, um, as a privileged white person and aspiring film worker, what can I do to be a more sensitive hire in a competitive and discriminatory, discriminatory job market? Does anybody want to take that? I just think really simply, if you're going to crew up or if you're going to work on a project or if you're in a decision making capacity, just try to have parity on your set. Yeah. Try, do your best to have 50% men and women, 50% people of color. Um, you know, I, I'm just making up the, the 50%, like you can kind of choose, but just make, make the choice to do that and go and go find it. Thank you. Um, from Riley, um, which have you seen as more diverse indie films or blockbusters and why do you think that is? is do they mean the cast or crew? or both? Um, both. I, I still don't think, I mean, if you look at the numbers, like there's all kinds of reports that come out each year from diversity. And I don't think, I, I, neither in the indie world or the blockbuster world are, are any of them doing great. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I would say they're probably both on this on the same footing as far as like need needs improvement. <laughs> I would agree. Um, I think UCLA puts out that report, uh, Kristen, and they're all the numbers are still very low. You know, in comparison to the population and the people that work in the industry. So um, yes, a needs improvement. <laughs> That's the grade <laughs> to get. So more work to be done. I know, like you know, Oscars and they try, you know, everyone's trying to diversify. There's been, um, and I think that's the next question about what do you think about the Oscars and their requirement for diversity? And I think that's just a new way of trying to, you know, get those numbers up. Yeah, it's, it's if you like really dig into that though, it is such a um, BS diversity. I mean, it. I give them credit because they're trying. I think it is the babiest of baby steps that you can take. So I hope they continue. I hope they don't just go, well, we did it everyone. Cause it's, 
it, yeah, but good for trying. <laughs> Um, these are good questions. I'm going to just keep um, rolling through them. Um, Aaron says, I'm about halfway through my college career in Nashville, but I feel like I'm getting stuck in my own circle of film majors at school. How can I meet other filmmakers um, in the community during COVID? Any ideas? There, I'm not sure what the young man's name is, but someone just started a Facebook page for PAs. And I just thought that was the best idea. Um, what a tremendous idea. Um, and so I would say, uh, Gabby, do you happen to know who that I was? Name, well? but I was just about to say that as well. It was great. I joined the group. <laughs> and so did I, just to be able to see like, hey, who's PA and, and who's, yeah. who's hungry, and who's after it. I think that's a killer place to start. I feel like you. And the oh, National so Filmmaker Skill is also a good group to join. And yeah. there's a student filmmaker skill as well, or group. Oh, that's cool. That meets a film. The name of that Facebook group? Is there a specific name, that PA group? I think it's called Nashville Production Assistants. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory for everybody to type. Um, I feel like, too, just getting connected, reach out to the people you want to work with. I feel like that's honestly how I've gotten a lot of opportunities. And then my biggest rule in life has always been realize people are busy and don't be afraid to email or text them twice because <laughs> I feel like people are busy and usually it's not because they're an asshole they literally are just busy so I feel like tons of people have texted me multiple times um and I feel like too you'll be surprised how willing people are to um one of the first people I got a huge opportunity from who I would say is one of my mentors I met him uh I walked on set of a Paramore video and met him and I emailed him a few months later and was like, hey, you're a creative director in town. That's what I want to do one day. Can I just like follow you? And I kept bothering him and we kept trying to meet for coffee and we never did. But one day I ran into him at Whole Foods <laughs> and oddly enough, he connected me to these other people and that I'd never met before. And he'd never even worked with me, but he connected me with another company that I started getting hired from. So I feel like just staying in people's ear and not being afraid of rejection is always great too. You may want to reach out to their assistant too. Mm. Go away. I think I think that was a super phenomenal advice, um, Gabby. And I I had someone um, who actually came to audition for the movie, and um, when when it was all done, she actually came back and she was like, "Hey, she, this is not a great question. Just if anyone wants to be a director out there to ask a director, because she said, "How do you direct?" And I just, <laughs> I think I was paralyzed with like, where do you even start with that question? But I said to her, I was like, look, why don't you come and shadow me one or two days on set? Um, here's my email. And I said that actually that exact same thing, Gabby. I said, I am very busy in pre-production right now. So you might have to email me twice. It is not because I'm ignoring you. I'm just super busy but I will give you like two days that you can come and visit on set. And she, and she followed up, she wrote me, she came and shadowed me. She wasn't like bothersome or annoying. She was perfect. She, she sat back, she asked it. And so I would just turn and I go, what do you, I have a second, what questions do you have? And so I would say just like, you know, Gabrielle said it from the different perspective of you kept bugging someone, but I had someone kind of bug me. And I am, I think the thing about filmmakers is like, we know what it's like to hustle and not, and, and have something that we want, but we can't quite get to. So I think this group is probably one of the most generous with their time and with like mentoring because we've been where you are. Um, unless someone's a trust fund baby and can just fund whatever movie they want, but I don't. <laughs> um, so I would just say, reach out to someone who you want that job and ask if you can shadow them one, one day, you know, two days and, don't don't be upset if they say no. Just move on to a different person who's nicer. Um, so okay, I, I said everybody we would have it would be an hour, so we can close it out. But so there was a question here that might be a nice one to end on if somebody wants to take this. What does success and diversity on on set look like? I think when we don't have to have these talks anymore. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> 
<laughs> have diversity talks and um... mic drop, Malisha. <laughs> 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 and call. <laughs> <My job. laughs> Leave meeting. Uh, exactly. that's, a, that's a great answer. That is a great answer. Um, so thank you. Thank you all so much. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but I think it's, I think that's pretty much says it all, right? Yeah, it does. Um, well, Malisha Edwards, Mark Jackson, Gabby Woodland, Kristen Baker, um, Dwayne Logan, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Nashville Filmmakers Guild, for um, putting this on and to everybody for listening and asking questions. I had a great time. To meet everyone. Thank you. Y'all yeah. have a good evening. Together for drinks. Hope to see you soon. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye. Nathan, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. See you later. See ya. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't do, um, let me, let me stop record. Um,